Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Cambridge Union, and welcome to our 14th speaker event of Michaelmas term. Our guest tonight is Lord Newberger. Lord Newberger is the current president of the Supreme Court of the UK, having been appointed to this position in October of 2012. He graduated from Christchurch, Oxford, with a degree in chemistry, being called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn in 1974. He became a QC in 1987 and a bencher in 1993. He was a Lord of Appeal in Ordinary until the House of Lords' judicial functions were transferred to the new Supreme Court in 2009, at which point he became the Master of Rose. His rise to the Court of Appeal and then to the House of Lords has been described as one of the quickest in recent times. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming him to the Cambridge Union. Thank you so much for coming all the way to Cambridge to speak to us. I suppose just to start things off, you read chemistry um, as an undergraduate and not law and then decided to pursue a career in law. What was the reason for that choice? I think I became a scientist because my father was a scientist and was very keen for his eldest son to become a scientist and I didn't really know what to do uh, at, for A-levels and so I did science. And I did well enough to get to the university. I went to Oxford and, did, and, and read chemistry. And I think I was conscious during my four years that I wasn't a very good scientist, but rather weakly didn't try and switch. I did a year's research, mm -hmm. and halfway through that year, I realized I was not a good scientist. <laughs> and um, so I had a, went to the um, careers advisory um, people, and was told basically after a bit of what's now I think called isometric testing, I had not, not a grand name like that then, that I was, um, should go into the city and be an investment banker or uh, a lawyer. And in those days, bankers didn't have to do exams, I had enough exams, so I went and became a, a, a banker. And <laughs> after about two years, I realized that if I'd been a bad scientist, I was a worse banker. <laughs> uh, and I think, in fact, if I'd stayed in banking, the banking crisis would have happened rather earlier than it did. And um, I looked around and, and didn't quite know what to do. Met a friend who had started at the bar as a barrister, and he described what he was doing. And I thought, that's what I want to do. It was a sort of moment that I'll always remember uh, until I become completely senile. And th that's what I then did. And I spent a year working in the bank, not very effectively, and in the evening doing law exams, and then went to the bar. There is a big debate amongst law students and law scholars in Cambridge about the, the use of a law degree if you want to practice law at university. And a few years ago, there was a debate in the faculty of law in Cambridge on the motion those who wish to practice law should not study law at university, and Lord Sumption was proposing that motion. Where do you stand in that debate? My general experience is if you ask a successful lawyer, should I read law, you can tell from his answer whether he read law or not, or she <laughs> read law. I'm actually quite neutral about it. I, I, I think, I do feel that I benefited from doing other things, and if you do law in the age of 18, uh, that's a disadvantage. On the other hand, I do honestly feel, and I'm sure some people who read my judgments would agree, that because I didn't have three years concentrating on law, I didn't get quite the depth into law that I might have got if I'd, if I'd read law. So I, I, I don't think it's an easy one to answer. I think my general advice is, if you know you want to be a lawyer, and there's nothing that you're really passionate about other than doing law, then by all means read law. And of course, you get to be a lawyer a year earlier, because you don't have to do the conversion course, so it saves you money as well. But if you're going to be a lawyer, um, and there's something that really interests you, and you can afford the extra year, then do the other thing that interests you, and then turn to law. Um, I, I think also a law degree is pretty good experience if you don't want to become a lawyer. It's quite a good thing, to, something to read. So I don't think there is a right answer. I, I think you, to some extent, go with the flow, do what you feel is right. The Supreme Court is obviously a big part of constitutional discussions here at Cambridge and just generally, and it's obviously a new addition to our constitutional architecture. 
I think it's fair to say that the move from the House of Lords to the Supreme Court is in many ways quite cosmetic, the changes. You've changed your name, you've modified some ways in which you do your practice and approach judgments, but by and large, your power and jurisdiction remains the same, as it were. So my question is, why do you think the move to the Supreme Court was worth it? Well, I, I got some unpopularity at the time it was decided on because I was a law lord and I was the only one who publicly said that I had my doubts about the move. I, I still feel pulled two ways about it in retrospect. My, my main objection was it was a very expensive exercise mm -hmm. for something which was ultimately cosmetic. Um, and it was a time which has now got worse, when money was very short for the courts, for legal aid, and for all aspects of the rule of law. And I was concerned that, in the context of the overall budget, it wasn't an enormous figure, but it was a large sum of money being spent on moving the law lords across the road into a new building, which would cost a lot of money, and would cost a lot more money to run. But it's been done, and I, I think the cosmetic argument is not insignificant. A lot of experienced, intelligent lawyers didn't quite know who the law lords were. At least with the Supreme Court, it's what it says on the tin. People know who we are. And the enormous benefit I think we've had is to be much more open and available for people to see. We stream our, our, our hearings. We have many more people from the public, members of the public, visiting us. Um, and it, it's partly that the move has, as it were, encouraged us to think out, out, out new ideas about how to present ourselves, but it's also given us the availability. And I think that has been an enormous benefit. And as for my doubts at the time, well, that's history, and we are where we are. And I hope we're making as good a fist of it as we can. Just to kind of follow up on that, and stay on this word supreme, obviously the court is unlike the American Supreme Court in that in this country, Parliament is sovereign and a court cannot strike down legislation in the same way that an American Supreme Court can. But I think it's fair to say that before the Supreme Court was introduced, there are certain judgments that reflect a very assertive tendency on the part of judges to protect certain fundamental rights. I'm talking about anisminic, which I'm sure many people here are familiar of. In uh, the recent judgment, the case of Evans, um, where a journalist wanted the communications between Prince Charles and the government to be released, you, in your leading judgment, adopted a very restrictive approach to the powers of the Attorney General to essentially veto decisions of courts. So, and against this backdrop and all of this, my question is, do you think that the court is now, because the court is now supreme, it is more likely to become more assertive or would there is more psychological tendency amongst the judges to become more assertive? One of my, my, I had two concerns about the creation of the Supreme Court. One was the money concern, spending money on that rather than on the rule of law elsewhere. And the other was the very point you've identified, would the judges become too self-important? I don't think that that has happened. I don't think that as a result of the move to the Supreme Court, we've become more assertive, more aiming to be like the US Supreme Court. Uh, it's fair to say it's difficult to measure because there have been various factors which have made the judges more powerful, if you like, more influential, more interventionist, whatever you like to use as an adjective, than we were, say, 20 or 30 years ago. The most obvious is the Human Rights Act. But I think also, uh, if I think about the judges I appeared in front of when I started as a barrister in the 1970s, they were temperamentally more conventional, more respectful of the government than my generation was. They were brought up in the 30s and 40s that were quite conventional, whereas I was a child of the 60s and uh, when I came of age in the 60s, and that was a much more rebellious time. And I think that's a factor that fed through. I think also uh, that um, over the past, since 1979, we've had largely, until 2010, we had governments with large majorities, which meant that the executive, through the cabinet and the prime minister, 
had quite a lot of hold over the legislature of the House of Commons. And that meant that there was a, a certain vacuum in power. And I think that to some extent, not consciously, but to some extent, the judges and indeed the media expanded a bit to fill that vacuum. And I think all those factors have tended to increase judicial power, but to nothing like its extent in most countries, as you say, which have a constitution. I had not an argument today, but a, 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 a little exchange with Brenda Hale, um, uh, the deputy president of the court, about whether or not we have a constitution. She said we do have a constitution, but it's not written. I said that I rather agreed with Sam Goldwyn, who said that an unwritten contract wasn't worth the paper it's written on. And um, an oral contract, sorry, isn't worth the paper it's written on. And um, I think in a way we haven't got a constitution because there's nothing to restrain parliament from changing anything it likes by a simple majority in the House of Commons. I mean, people think of Magna Carta as being a constitution but virtually every clause in Magna Carta has been repealed by Parliament over the years. And in that sense, we don't have any control. And the idea of over mighty judges compared with most countries is a fiction. Well, you, you say that, but if we go back to Anis Minik and look very carefully at what was happening there, and obviously I'm aware that there are lots of non-lawyers in this room, but what the court was doing was essentially rewriting a statute, which is so clear in saying that the jurisdiction of the court has been ousted in this area. And uh, the court reasoned this on various kind of grounds of interpretation, etc. But do you think when the court is confronted with a situation where parliament is infringing potentially on fundamental rights, do you think it would be better for the court to just squarely confront what it is doing as opposed to trying to hide and mask what it is doing in interpretation and it comes down ultimately to what Lord Hoffman expressed extremely well in the Sims case, which I quoted in, in the Evans in case Evans. and a number of other people have quoted, that if Parliament is going to take away a fundamental right, or if the government is going to take away a fundamental right, like in Anis Minnick, access to the court, then it has to spell it out in a statute in very, very clear terms. <laughs> because MPs and peers, if it goes to the House of Lords, have to appreciate and have to be told, if you pass this statute, you are taking away somebody's or all citizens' fundamental rights of going to the court on this issue. And if that isn't spelt out, then the courts are going to say it's not what the Act means. It might appear to be what the Act says, but it's general words. They're not specific enough. And I think, in a way, in Annie's Minnick, because it was in 1968, if I remember rightly, which was during the relatively uh, deferential period, uh, the courts didn't quite bring themselves to say that in ringing terms. By the time we get to 2000, which I think was the year of Sims, uh, we had the courts being more confident and more clear about their function, and you had Lord Hoffman, and indeed Lord Stain, and in a later case, Lady Hale, saying that in clear terms. Moving on to the composition of the judiciary and the gender imbalance, obviously in our Supreme Court there is only one female judge at the moment. And despite the best efforts of many parties, the bar and the judiciary still continues to remain male dominated. One, you, one of your colleagues on the court, Lord Sumption, quite controversially said recently, and referring to this problem, he said that the bar and the solicitor's professions are incredibly demanding in the hours of work and the working conditions are frankly appalling. There are more women than men who are not prepared to put up with that. And that's a direct quote. What do you have to say about that? And what do you think are the real problems with this, the real contributing factors to this gender imbalance? I have to be quite careful about pontificating about the legal profession because I've been away from it for 19 years as a judge. I have to admit, I have three children, all of whom are lawyers, and their other halves are, are lawyers. But, um, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not, I, I, I'm not unaware of what goes on, but it's, it's second-hand information. I, I think that the truth is that, that the law, if you're in private practice as a solicitor or barrister, is generally very demanding. And it requires almost, 
24-7, some might say 36-7 commitment um, from people in many areas. I mean, there are firms which, where that's not true. There are chambers where that's not true. But if you go to the best-known solicitors or the best-known chambers, it's difficult not to um, find yourself being expected to work very long hours and without that much holiday. Now, I think what Lord Tumption was getting at was that it is more difficult for those either who have a balanced view of life or, even more significantly, those with other responsibilities, families and so on, whether it's children or parents or uh, other responsibilities, uh, to give that sort of commitment. And in the world we are, certainly in my generation, it was much more often women who took on those responsibilities than men. Now, in many cases, that's unfair because in many cases, there's no reason why it should be the woman rather than the man. And I notice in my children's generation, there is, it, it's less of a, it's less, there's less typecasting than there was in my generation. Now, how far uh, the, the, the relatively low proportion of women at the top of the profession, whether solicitors or barristers, is attributable to that, how far it's attributable to um, unconscious bias, how far it's attributable to conscious bias, I can't really say. But I'm sure it's, there's a significant factor is other responsibilities. And I think the legal profession should be doing something about it. And I think that some firms of solicitors, some sets of chambers are doing something about it. I think the best place for the pressure to come in a perfect world would be from clients. Because in the end, solicitors and barristers need clients if the clients start saying, look, you haven't got enough senior women, you haven't got enough senior ethnic minorities, you haven't got enough senior people who were not at public school. That would be a very strong pressure factor. Are you in favor of a regime of positive discrimination to fix these problems in the judiciary, which you clearly identified just now? Yeah, I haven't dealt with the judiciary yet, you're quite right. Um, I'm not in favor of quotas. I am in favor of what I think is the, the tipping point our argument, which is quite controversial because it all depends what you mean by equal. But I've no, sorry? Controversy is good. Yes, yes controversy is good. <laughs> but if you have two equal candidates and one's a man and one's a woman, one's a public school and one's not, one's ethnic minority and one's not, then obviously it's very difficult to argue and I argue against and I would support the notion that you take the minority person. Uh, the difficulty always is what you mean by equal and so on. But I think one can have a fairly broad definition of equal. But in terms of quotas, no, I am against them, I must admit. Um, I see the argument. I mean, 10 years ago, if you'd asked me, I'd have been completely against quotas. Now, I still am, but I do see the argument. Okay. Um, moving on to talk a bit about Europe and the impact that has on this country and the work that you do as president of the Supreme Court. Last year, you told a group of lawyers in Australia that the UK judges have sometimes been too ready to assume that a decision re represents the law according to Strasbourg and accordingly to follow it. Why do you think the UK courts pay so much respect and importance to Strasbourg in light of the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty? Two points, really. Well, three points, I suppose. I don't see a problem about parliamentary sovereignty. Whenever we are accused, judges are accused of going against the will of parliament on a human rights point, it seems to me it's a completely misconceived argument. The only reason we have the power to rule on human rights issues is because parliament's given us that right under the Human Rights Act. And we have to do that. We have to decide human rights points according to the law as we see it. And it's because Parliament gave us that power that we're doing it. But I, I, I think there are two other points. One is that until 2000, when the Human Rights Act came into force, um, a couple of years after it was passed, until 2000, we were in a rather unreal world where UK judges were deciding cases on the basis of domestic law. We were not able to take into account human rights. And we'd often decide a case one way, knowing that the loser would then go off to Strasbourg and the Strasbourg court would say, well, once you take into account human rights, uh, you should have won. So you get damages from the UK government. 
And that was a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. And the Human Rights Act put that right, because we can now decide the case according to human rights and take into account human rights. But that means that we should take into account what Strasbourg does, because if we just ignored Strasbourg, we would start going back to the old system, whereby we would say the Human Rights Act means this, Strasbourg would say it means something else, and you'd be back to the two streams of cases starting here, and then the loser going to Strasbourg. So we do have to pay attention to Strasbourg. But having said that, I think we have, you're right, and I did say, and I do think, that in the past we've paid too much to regard to Strasbourg, in the sense that we've treated each decision almost as the Court of Appeal might treat a Supreme Court decision. And that's not right, because Strasbourg is a more flexible court. It's not so bound by um, previous decisions as we regard our courts as being. It's more flexible. Um, and uh, it's more prepared to change its mind, perhaps, partly because it's dealing in, in, in the area of human rights, which is quite a flexible area in some ways, so fact-sensitive. And I think that, that, that because our mindset is to treat a court which we regard almost as the ultimate appeal court, as a superior court, we think we should be following its decisions. The other reason I think we were too ready to follow its decisions was because human rights were new. We as UK judges weren't used to deciding human rights points. Strasbourg was, so we were inclined to think Strasbourg knew better than we did what they were doing, and initially they probably did. But now we've been trying human rights cases for 15 years, and we've learned that Strasbourg will listen to us if we say, look, we think you got that wrong, think again. It doesn't always agree that it's got it wrong, but it will, has done so in one or two cases, a few cases. We are more, I think we should be more ready to spread our wings and be more independent. Uh, thank you for focus, uh, bringing the topic back to human rights, which is obviously very topical at the moment with the Human Rights Act in the media. Obviously, before the Human Rights Act came into force, the courts had their own common law methods of protecting certain fundamental rights which they deemed to be in worthy of protection. So in light of that backdrop, how worried are you that the repeal of the Human Rights Act will affect the ability of this country to protect human rights properly? Well, I, I think it's a Human Rights Act and its repeal is a highly political issue, and I have to be very careful what I say. And even if that wasn't true, it would be very difficult for me to comment until I knew what the government was proposing to replace it with. As I understand it, the government is not proposing to get rid of human rights. It merely wants to recast some aspects of the Human Rights Act. And until I know what they propose, I would feel... A well, it would just be silly, in a sense, for me to comment on what we might do. W what I would say, though, is this. I think that with the coming into law of the Human Rights Act, lawyers and judges were a bit, it almost harks back to my answer before, lawyers and judges were a bit like a, a child with a new toy. We had human rights that we'd never had before. We'd seen them going on for 50 years across the channel, and now we had them as part of our law. And I think we got very keen and interested in human rights, and we rather took our eye off the common law ball, as it were. Uh, like a child with a new toy, we, we left the old common law toy in the cupboard. And one thing that I've been keen to do, and which I think the Supreme Court has done in a few cases recently, is to say, look, the common law isn't dead. We should be developing the common law. And so long as we've got human rights, common law and human rights will learn from each other and, and march together. And so, it, particularly in a case called Kennedy, which was concerned with uh, journalists wanting to see um, the Charity Commission's report on a charity run by the uh, 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 well-known character um, George Galloway. Um, the claim was brought under the Human Rights Act, and the journalists were saying he had a right to see this document uh, under freedom of speech. And we said, saying you have to get somebody to the government to, or a government organization to give you a document of the right of free speech is taking the law too far. But, we said, we think you've got a claim in common law. And he hadn't run it in common law, so the case is, I think, going back to be heard in common law. But it was, I was very pleased about that because I think we should be developing the law, the common law, and that's what we're doing. 
I mean, you yourself just conceded that obviously the Human Rights Act is a very political issue, and that the political nature of that is perhaps exacerbated by the media, which is obviously a big contributing factor to this debate. So I suppose my question is, how do judges in this day and age with social media allowing you to communicate information, judgments, particularly judgments on political issues so quickly, how do judges maintain their objectivity, neutrality, and their appearance of being objective and neutral with all these media pressures surrounding the decisions they make? You're right that the focus of the cameras and instant blogging and texting um, and all other means of electronic communication does make us more exposed, does make us more conscious and uh, of, of what people think. Uh, and also, we talk more in public. I mean, in, in the 1950s, um, the Lord Chancellor, who had more control over the judges in those days because he was the top judge uh, as well as being um, a government minister, one of the changes that was made 10 years ago, uh, but he was approached by the BBC asking whether they could invite uh, three judges to come along on three programmes that they were running on the radio about famous judges of the past, one of whom was Lord Mansfield. They want to invite three serving judges to talk about uh, these judges. And Lord, uh, the, 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 the Chan Lord Chancellor, Lord Kilmuir, said he was not prepared to have any judge taking part in, in public entertainment of that sort. <laughs> Um, and we've moved a long way from mm -hmm. that, and judges talk a lot in public. Um, some might say too much. Um, <laughs> and um, so we expose ourselves, if I can put it that way, uh, as well as um, being exposed through the media. I think one gets used to it. I mean, if I can, it, it, it's not, not a perfect analogy, but when I was a High Court judge and a Court of Appeal judge, um, I wasn't ever filmed. I was in court and it was just a, not a private occasion, but I wasn't filmed. In the Supreme Court, you're filmed the whole time. The camera could be on you. And initially, you're very conscious of it. But after a bit, you forget about it. My colleagues still tell me I slouch and should be sitting up and that sort of thing. <laughs> and, and it's a bad idea to fall asleep during argument because the camera might catch you. But, but I, I think, on the whole, you just learn to cope with it. It becomes part of, of life. Um, I think you must learn not to be indignant. Um, the press, as you say, often do criticize us, often quite rude about us. And I never know whether I feel crosser when um, they're rude about me and I think actually they've got a point, I could have put that better. Or whether I'm crosser when I think that's very unfair. But I think it's, it's, it's very important that judges are exposed uh, to public scrutiny. Because without that, you don't have open justice. And if you don't have open justice, people don't trust the justice system. And in due course, judges will get into bad habits. So I think one has to accept that we are in this world where you are much more open to scrutiny. And um, just carry on and hope that it doesn't influence you too much. But you, you, you have to take into account public opinion a bit. The difficult thing is knowing whether bloggers or newspapers are typical of what everyone thinks because maybe they're not. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for taking my questions. I'm now going to open the event up to the floor, as I'm sure there are many people who want to ask you many questions. How we're going to do this is wait for a microphone to reach you. I'm going to ask you that you please keep your questions brief so we can cover as many people as possible. Lord Neuberger has very kindly offered to take questions on topics outside of the interview questions. So please feel free to kind of go into something else if you feel inclined to do so. Are there any questions for Lord Neuberger? Yes, gentlemen at the back. Uh, thanks very much for being here this evening. Could you stand up, please? Sure. That's okay. Hi. Thanks very much for being here this evening. Uh, Thank you for having me. You talked a little bit about Lord Mansfield, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your own both practicing and judicial idols, uh, both in your time in practice and on the bench. In, in terms of what, the work I did or? Yeah, uh, both in terms of ethic and the sorts of results they came to and in terms of people you admired? When I went to the bar, it was a very, even by present standards, a very white public school male world. 
I mean, it, it got better. I'm afraid I wasn't quite aware of, of the fact, as I am now, because it wasn't something that was really thought about. One took it for granted, I'm afraid, and that's all part of what I say about and mean about subconscious bias. It's the world I grew up in. And to give an example now, no, no set of changes would take a pupil other than through an open competition and advertising and giving everyone a fair chance of applying and then having interviews and so on. And many chambers won't even take a pupil uh, without having given all potential pupils a mini pupillage to see what they're like. When I went to the bar, I had one friend whose father was a barrister. And he got in, he, he, his son put in, me in touch with him. And he said, ah, oh, David, splendid, you're coming to the bar. Uh, you must join my chambers. But before you do that, you better have a pupillage with my friend Donald. So he rang up his friend, and his friend took me as a pupil. And that was that. I mean, looking back, it seemed absolutely natural at the time. But it, 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 looking back, it was very unfair. I had, didn't have many contacts, unlike many of my friends. I had one, but that was enough. And that's how I started. Now, to be fair, uh, it turned out my friend's father wasn't in the chambers I wanted to go to. Um, and they, I think, collapsed shortly afterwards. Um, I don't think it's because I was going there. I think it was, would have happened anyway. And, and the pupillage I was in, I didn't get taken on in those chambers. I moved to another set of chambers um, because I knew somebody there, and he took me as a pupil. And they took on somebody else rather than me. And then I went for a third pupillage um, to another set of chambers where they took somebody rather than me. So I had three pupillages which ended up without me being taken on and somebody else being taken on. So I didn't have it all easy. And then I, my fourth pupillage was at a chamber I didn't really want to go to because they did landlord and tenant work, disputes between landlords and tenants. And I didn't really think that appealed to me. But because I was rather desperate, because I had three failed pupillages. I went there with, as I say, some regret and no enthusiasm. And as often happens in life, and you've probably found it already yourselves, but if not, you will find in due course, what you think is unfortunate and bad luck turns out often to be the best thing that happened. And those chambers and the work in those chambers suited me down to the ground because it was lots of small cases to begin with which meant I wasn't led. I was quite jealous of my grander friends who were in commercial chambers doing grand cases, earning lots of money. But most of the cases they were doing, they were being led on. I was going around county courts doing small cases, but learning advocacy in, 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 in what was often very tricky cases, solicitors who hadn't prepared cases properly, judges who were in a hurry, bad-tempered, and often didn't know much about this area of the law. And it was very good training. And you lived on your wits a bit. And I really enjoyed it. But it was not a grand practice. It was mostly in the county courts, uh, going round mostly in the southeast of England and London, but outside as well. And gradually, I built up a, a practice. And um, I was lucky because it was an area of law which was um, getting more upmarket, more respectable, because property values were going up. And so there was more money involved, so there was more cases to fight. And because circuit judges were not always as well-informed and, uh, and, and able to have a lot of, as much time as high court judges try cases, there were more appeals. So I did a lot of work in the Court of Appeal. And then I got bigger work, more commercial work. And I, I then... At another stroke of luck, I did a case in front of the vice chancellor, who's the head of the senior judge of the chancery division. And he asked me a technical question in my area of law, which was really, to, to an outsider, extremely technical and difficult question, but to an insider, um, actually a bog standard question. And the answer involved going to three different statutes, four different rules of court, and two cases. So I took him through that very quickly. And he was obviously quite impressed because he then asked me to sit as a deputy high court judge. And I found that I enjoyed that. And then I got an offer of becoming a high court judge in the chancery division. The disadvantage of becoming a judge is you, you, to be blunt, you get paid less. You slightly feel when you become a judge that you, 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 you're giving up your freedom. I, I didn't, you know, there the are things which a, a barrister, even a QC, 
uh, can get away with if he's caught, which may be embarrassing, but I'm not saying I'd want to do that, but you had the freedom to do that. If you became a judge, you can't do that sort of thing. And that's partly a loss of freedom. Partly, it, you get paid less as a judge. And partly, um, you, you, you feel you must be quite old to be a judge, which is always a bit startling. So the advantage is that you get a wider range of work. As I say, I did very little other than property-related work, but when I became a judge, it got broader. It was chancery work, so it was intellectual property, bankruptcy, quite a lot of professional negligence, uh, as well as property work. Um, and um, it's a big switch from being a barrister to being a judge, and some people regret doing it because it doesn't turn out to be successful. I was lucky it did work out. I then went to the Court of Appeal, and I got lucky in the Court of Appeal. I had two, three cases about human rights, which I'd done nothing with as a judge. Public law I hadn't done at all because I was a chancery judge. And I was lucky enough to, to get them right when my colleagues didn't, and they went to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords said I'd got it right. I can think of some cases of mine I wish they hadn't seen, but these were ones I'm glad they had seen. So I, I got to the House of Lords quite quickly as a law lord. And then when the Lords went to the Supreme Court, I was the, the, the master of the rolls job, the head of the Court of Appeal became vacant, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do it, but I thought in life, one of the disadvantages of being a judge, as I say, is you feel much more limited in your scope. So the opportunity of a different job, possibly running the Court of Appeal, um, appealed to me as a, an alternative, so I did that. And then this job became available. I think underneath it, I find it quite difficult to walk past the ladder without trying to climb it. So this job came up, so this is what I applied for and got. Next question. Yes, gentlemen at the back. Hi, I was just wondering, in the context of case in your judgment in the Nick Clinton case, how would you gauge the response by Parliament to this and to the issue of the right to die? And if a similar case would come before you today, would you have decided the judgment in a different way? I'm very sorry, I've got to be cagey about this because the Parliament decided not to change the law. I think there's a real prospect that a case will come to us to ask us to consider where we go from here in light of what we said in Nicklinson and what Parliament's decided. And it's not really right for me to express a view about what we should do or might do. Um, if I did, uh, then I would either end up looking stupid because I would do something else when it came, or else, more likely, one of the parties would fairly object because I'd expressed a view in public. But even more importantly, it's going to be quite an interesting and difficult issue, and one would have to see what the arguments were. So I'm sorry, I've got to duck that question. Next question. Yes, gentlemen at the back. Uh, Lord Newberg, you spoke earlier tonight about uh, cuts to legal aid, and I know in the last couple of years you've spoken on this topic a fair amount. Could you expand on why you think that is a very significant issue, um, in particular in relation to civil law cases, but as well as criminal law cases? Certainly. Um, one starts off with the proposition that the rule of law means that people have to be given rights. The rights that we've been looking at today, as in many public discussions, have been human rights because they're new and interesting and developing. But of course, we give people all sorts of rights in common law, rights to sue for nuisance, trespass, personal injury, divorce, rights to children, and so on. And they're absolutely fundamental to the rule of law. But it's no good giving people rights unless they can enforce those rights. Uh, and if they want to enforce those rights against other people, it's no good having, saying you've got the rule of law if the other people can't defend themselves against claims. Now, 
access to the courts is expensive in this country. Um, and most people either can't afford to enforce or defend themselves out of their own pocket or have to give up an enormous disproportionate sacrifice to do so if they're going to do so through lawyers. And you need lawyers for two reasons. One is to give you advice as to what your rights are, what your prospects of success in fighting a case would be. And the other is a lawyer to represent you because you only have to look at the, the, the law books. You only have to look at Halsbury statutes to see how complex the statute law is. And of course, there's a whole lot of common law on top of it. And even lawyers have to specialize quite narrowly. So to expect ordinary members of the public to know their way around the law is unrealistic. Now, in order to deal with that, you need to be able to fund litigation. Until the 1990s, the government did a pretty good fist of things with legal aid. It wasn't perfect, and of course, no system is perfect, but it wasn't bad. Then, for reasons which you can understand if you're looking at government finances, they had to cut back. I'm not saying it was right or wrong, but it was unfortunate. They introduced a system to try and fund litigation, um, the conditional fee agreements and so on, which did do something to ameliorate the situation by cutting back legal aid, but was arguably very unfair on defendants. And the law was then changed about five years ago to try and well, to make it more fair, but as a result of which it's now more difficult uh, to litigate uh, if you're going to employ lawyers. Meanwhile, legal aid has been cut back yet further. Now, I think the government has a duty to make the courts available, make access to justice available, and there is an argument that it is now cutting to the quick, the situation, the, 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 the ability to, for people to litigate. You just look at the increase in litigants in person, which is not good for the legal system because they take up a lot of court time. If a judge is conscientious, he's got to spend, or she has got to spend a lot more time trying a case with a litigant in person, and that costs money at a different place for the government. And you're less likely to get justice. But one's forgetting all the people who aren't litigants in person, but who aren't able to take their case to court. Now, it's not just the government that has to do something about this. The judges and the lawyers have to do something. And I've for years said that we have to do what I've called quick and dirty justice. If you have a claim worth 10,000 pounds, it is ridiculous that in order to fight it, it will cost 100,000 pounds. And we have to adapt our system so that we can have much cheaper, quicker litigation to solve problems and get an answer, even if it's less perfect, uh, than a much more expensive system. And there are moves, for instance, to have um, online dispute resolution, mediation, and those sort of moves, which are being supported by um, the Ministry of Justice, have been spearheaded by the judges and the lawyers. And I think that's the sort of area we should be looking at. But I think we have got serious cause for concern about access to justice in this country. Next question. Yes, gentleman in the front. Um, hi there. Um, so you said you lost a lot of your, you lose a lot of your freedom when you go from becoming a barrister to a judge. So let's just take it back to when you matriculated in 1966. This was a very revolutionary area era characterized by sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Now, can you tell us if your time at Cambridge was characterized by sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or if you did something a bit more productive with your social life? Um, well, it was at Oxford, not at Cambridge. <laughs> um, I had some of those things. <laughs> I don't think that I would say much more than that. <laughs> Quite a lot of rock and roll. I think that's a good answer. Next question. Um, Lord Uber, what would you say is your most revolutionary judgment? 
I suppose the sensible answer is probably it's not for me to say. Um, my most revolutionary judgment. I think you, you, you I mean, it's made, I can't point to any wide-ranging revolutionary judgment, I don't think. I suppose if I was an old-fashioned judge, I'd say I'm proud to say I've never given a revolutionary judgment. <laughs> but I, I don't really like to think that. So I, I, I think you've taken me by surprise on that one in a way that I can't immediately think of a good answer. I think my Evans judgment was, by some people, was thought to be a bit revolutionary. But as you rightly said, to some extent, it was built on Annie's mimic. Um, If I think of an answer before we finish this evening, I'll let you know. <laughs> Next question. Yes. Uh, it's very privileged for me um, to be here today. Um, it was very fascinating. I would like to ask you um, if you could assist us uh, to seize the trafficking organ uh, legislation uh, for China. As you may know, in the last 16 years, trafficking organ by Chinese government going on, and over 107,000 uh, 107, lawsuits against the Jiang Zemin, former Communist Party, for genocide against the humanity. He ordered uh, take the organ from prisoner of conscience Falun Gong, Tibet, uh, Chris, House Christian, and Muslim Uyghur. And also, he was responsible for Tiananmen Square. And he was purely of jealousy, he ordered that. The, and we have two pro con human rights lawyer called David Matis, David Kilgar, and also Macmillan from Pos House of Parliament. England, they are, they are campaigning for years to, to our MP. Uh, in Cardiff, in Scotland, around the UK to bring a law, not to get organ from prisoner of conscience. Thank you. This be very concerning, but you have to understand that as a judge, I'm limited to what can be done in this country. We're in the middle of a case, actually, quite an interesting case, about um, people who say that they've been uh, tortured uh, by other countries' um, officers with, allegedly with British government assistance. And the argument is whether we can, uh, whether that is justiciable, whether that can be decided by a judge in the UK um, in circumstances where it involves making allegations against foreign states. And across the world, national judges are very reluctant to get involved in decisions which involve criticizing foreign states. They have to be dealt with in international courts. So while I sympathize with a lot of what you say in my judicial capacity, I'm afraid I, I, I can't be very helpful. Next question. Yes, gentleman in the front. Thank you. Um, going back to Evans, if I may, um, mainly because it might be your most revolutionary judgment, how would you say Parliament could make its intentions clear? Because <clears throat> it's all well and good saying Parliament needs to be clear, Parliament needs to be clear, but they said the word reasonably and reasonable, and the interpretation, which I think is a good interpretation, but it, and you gave strains that I think I certainly accept that it, it could be said to strain <coughs> the meaning, but I think that's what happens if you say that something has to be spelt, has to be crystal clear before you accept that it means what uh, was being said on behalf of the Attorney General it meant. Um, so much of legal disputes come down to as it were, what you think, qualitative assessment. I can't say I was obviously right. 
the Court of Appeal agreed with me, two of my colleagues agreed with me, but a number of my colleagues didn't agree with me. And obviously, I, I don't think that the argument you, you're putting forward that I was wrong is absurd or insulting. I think there's a perfectly respectable body of lawyers and others who would agree with you. But I, I think that the whole point of saying of the Sims principle, if you like, is that you require words that are crystal clear. And I don't think those words were clear. They were, to use Lord Hoffman's expression, general words. But they were not telling Parliament, look here, you do realise that for the first time in any legislation in history, you are saying that a member of the executive can override a decision of a court. And to my mind, that is quite revolutionary to a lawyer, and maybe not to a politician. But if politicians want to do it, if the government wants to do it, they really should spell it out to Parliament. Thanks. But so often these matters are, these issues are matters of opinion, matters of judgment, matters of degree. And it's why we in the Supreme Court quite often disagree. A question shouldn't come to us, or rarely should come to us if it's easy. And on difficult questions of law, there often is room for more than one answer. Sometimes I'm surprised how often we are unanimous. We have time for two more questions. Are there any questions for Lord Newberg? Yes, gentleman at the back. Um, so as a property lawyer, you were evidently very uncomfortable in stacking down in, in your dissenting speech. Uh, my question is, to what extent uh, does doing justice between the parties trump legal principle? That is another example. It's, a, if you like, a broader example of what I was discussing a minute ago. I think that is an ongoing difficulty for any judge, for any academic in law. To what extent do you look at the merits and fairness in a particular case? And to what extent do you look at legal certainty and clarity? I think, although self-analysis is not one of the average judge's strongest characteristics, I think I tend to favor legal certainty. It's all very well having a case in front of you where you feel fairness demands a certain result. But you have to bear in mind that, particularly if you are Supreme Court, you are laying down a principle that's going to be applied in lots and lots, sometimes hundreds or even more of cases where the merits may be very different. And to be seduced by the merits of a particular case uh, is not good in principle and actually not good in practice for all the other cases. Now, to be fair, let me say at once that in Stack and Dowden, I don't think that my colleagues were actually seduced by the facts of the particular case. Um, I, Stack and Dowden was a case I dissented. It involved um, a question of how you share out a house bought in the name of two people who aren't married if it's taken in their joint name. And my four colleagues said the presumption was that it's owned 50-50. I said, applying what I regarded as well-established law, it's held in the proportion which they contributed. So if I paid 50,000 and you paid 10, I'd own five-sixths of it. But my colleagues said the presumption would be it would be owned 50-50 because it was in joint name. So on that one, I don't think in the end there was, I think the difference between us really was that I felt that if it was a commercial, or, or if it was a commercial enterprise, it would be ridiculous to say it was 50-50. And once you start mucking around with, res with domestic, why is it different from domestic and commercial? And if you've got mixed commercial and, and domestic use, how does it work, etc.? So I, I was rather conservative on that one. Um, and I think the difference, I wrote the, the only judgment that way. And the main judgment the other way was written by Brenda Hale. And I think all the family practitioners agree with her and all the property practitioners agree with me. So that portrays our background and prejudices, perhaps. Um, we have time for one final question. Yes, gentlemen at the back. Hello. If Parliament passed a law that went against the fundamental right and it was made explicitly clear, do the courts have the power to do anything about it 
would they do anything about it, and should they do something about it? The traditional official view is that the courts cannot overrule a primary piece of legislation, a statute. So if Parliament said X in clear terms, then however wrong the judges felt it was, they would have to knuckle under and say X was the law. There have been academic writings suggesting that if Parliament passed a very extreme statute, the judges would have the right, indeed the duty, to overcome it, to say it wasn't in accordance with fundamental principles, a quasi-constitutional function like the US courts and so many other Supreme Courts have. The only time the judges have touched on it in a judgment was in the hunting case, where it was suggested that if, for instance, the government passed a statute which got rid of all judicial review, i.e. said no member of the public had the right to challenge a decision of the executive, whether of a local authority or a quango or a government department, in court, however wrong it was, if that was passed by parliament, then the judges would effectively say it was ineffective. Now, that would be revolutionary. It would put the judges in direct confrontation with parliament and the executive. I've always taken the view it's a very nice debate as to whether that should happen or could happen. But I think if we had a government that was doing something so wrong as that, we would probably be up the creek anyway. Um, and the argument is therefore rather academic. But I think my official answer is that I've no doubt that the standard rule is that we can't overrule Parliament. If a point came where we thought there was a piece of legislation that was so wrong we should reconsider that rule, then maybe we would have to do that. But until it comes, and I devoutly hope it won't come, and I strongly suspect it won't come, uh, I would duck the question again. And I still haven't managed to think of a revolutionary decision of mine. I think I better go back after today and become a bit more revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our 14th speaker event of term. On behalf of the standing committee, I'd like to thank you for coming all the way to Cambridge to speak to us. This is our 200th anniversary year, and we are truly honored to have you as part of these celebrations. I hope you can all join me in thanking Lord Newberg for speaking at the committee. <laughs>